Hi, this is Joe Ziemba, the host of When Football Was Football here on the Sports History Network. Aside from my podcasting duties, I'm also a sports collector. And as such, I'm very pleased to share the exciting news that the Sports History Network has partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. So as a collector, I was very pleased when I visited the site of Rochester Sports Autographs. The massive inventory is easy to search, carefully documented, and visually appealing. The options seem limitless, whether you're looking for an autographed baseball, signed football helmets, or basketball jerseys, among thousands of others. I found everything from a Babe Ruth autograph, a signed football by Dick Butkus, and an autographed Larry Bird basketball jersey. And as a collector, you'll be delighted with the very competitive pricing on JSA authenticated products. Made possible since RSA deals directly with athletes, so there's no extra markup, and the savings are passed on directly to the customer. Perhaps you're looking for an early gift for Mother's Day or Father's Day? Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your own sports collection, right? RSA even has film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site. So there's something for everyone. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you need to do is head to shoprsa.com forward slash shn. That's shop rsa.com forward slash shn to get your own piece of sports history today. In the early 1920s, baseball was in trouble. The 1919 Black Sox scandal of the World Series put it on its ear, and now a new scandal in the mid-1920s looked like it was going to crush baseball. Our guest tonight is Dan Taylor, author of the book, Baseball at the Abyss. He's going to tell us how if baseball recovered and who the people were that saved it. It's all coming up with Dan in just a moment. Hey, this is Darren Hayes. You've probably heard me on the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch. Well, welcome to my journey of learning more about sports history. And we're going to do it by learning about the great athletes and the uniforms that they wore as they both tell a lot about the games that we love and have watched so much throughout most of our lives. These are the chronicles I'm going to share with you on what I've learned through my journey in the Sports Jersey Dispatch. Hello, my friends of sports history. This is Darren Hayes of the Sports Jersey Dispatch Podcast. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your place for all things great in sports history. And welcome to another evening as we get to talk to an author that has a really intriguing story about baseball. It's a it has everything. It talks about one of baseball's all-time greatest players, some scandal, and what many consider may be the best Major League Baseball team ever assembled and a major innovation of professional sports. His name is Dan Taylor, and his book is titled Baseball at the Abyss, The Scandal of 1926, Babe Ruth, and the Unlikely Savior Who Rescued a Tarnished Game. Dan Taylor, welcome to the pig pen. Oh, thanks. It's a great invitation and happy to be here. Yeah, Dan, uh, your book, I just recently got done reading it. And I tell you what, I was uh, I was ready to go out and play, you know, baseball from 100 years ago, or at least go watch a game because you really took the reader, me into the moment of the era and uh, uncovered some things that I wasn't aware of. And I read quite a bit of uh, books on history of sports, especially baseball and football. And uh, there's a lot of this I wasn't aware of. So I appreciate uh, what you've done here in this book. Well, thanks. Don't let that motivation make you go out and grab a 56 ounce bat and wreck your shoulders or anything like that. But no, it was equally fascinating for me as I started off looking at one little facet of that time period and, and it just expanded and grew and sent me into areas that uh, I, I was really astonished to learn about. So it was a fun project to do and, and, uh, and I hope the readers will uh, find it equally interesting. Yeah, so, so let's leave that as a tease for for a moment. Let's learn a little bit more about you. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, you know, give us the the five cent tour at to the point of you becoming a fan of you know the great game of baseball and writing some books about it. 
you know what's amazing is I've, I got turned on to baseball by my grandfather. And the thing about that is he was an immigrant from Scotland. So he, he had a soccer background, but uh, uh, when he came to this country, they made him go back to school because he had graduated younger than 18 over in Scotland. And uh, he said, I'm going to learn these American games. And he, he got into baseball and he passed that down to me and uh, became a huge fan of, of Willie Mays uh, following the Giants. And uh, my background, I, I live here in Fresno, California, uh, was a television sportscaster out here for 30 years. Uh, kind of switched over uh, to telling stories by writing rather than wearing makeup and talking and reading them off a teleprompter. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the present time, I also do some broadcasting for the uh, minor league team here in Fresno, the Fresno Grizzlies, the uh, single-A affiliate of the Colorado Rockies. Wow, that's uh, quite a background and quite makes you quite an expert here uh, to talk about these subjects, uh, even from baseball from almost 100 years ago. So I guess uh, let, let's set up the story, you know, the, the title says quite a bit in it, but it was a lot more uh, unexpectedness happening in that uh, the book than just what the title says. But why don't you go ahead and lay the foundation for what the book's about? Well, I think the interesting thing was we all have heard about the 1919 Black Sox, the scandal of the Chicago White Sox throwing the 1919 World Series to the Cincinnati Reds. And I don't think general baseball fans and baseball historians have a grasp of how serious a scandal a few years later following the 1926 season was. And this particular scandal, it involved Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker. Uh, they were accused of fixing and betting on games. Uh, initially, they uh, were banned from, uh, from baseball by the president of the American League. It led to some big and, and very contentious uh, hearings that uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis held. They ended up being reinstated. Um, and the, but the game was really in trouble. Uh, major, major sports writers... Uh, suggested that the uh, the credibility of baseball was in peril, uh, that uh, they talked about it uh, slumping to the level of horse racing and, and wrestling in terms of uh, lacking credibility. And at that time, Babe Ruth was going through some difficulty. Uh, he really uh, became re-energized in that particular offseason and went on to have his greatest season ever and erased the tarnish of the, uh, the winter scandals with a remarkable run toward a record 60 home runs on a Yankee team that was just an absolute juggernaut and swept the Pirates in the World Series. Yeah, and that hurts as a Pirates fan. You know. Sorry, yeah, I apologize. That's, that's okay. Even though I'm, I'm glad I wasn't there, but that's okay. But uh, you know, it's really uh, interesting the way that you you put the book together because you are introducing these big names from baseball. You're talking you know, about Judge Landis and Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker, Babe Ruth, Gehrig are in there, and you have sort of this. Uh, unheard of character to me that I didn't know much about in what became a great innovator of uh, professional sports, Mr. Uh, Christy, Christy Walsh, Christy Walsh. Yes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? And, and that was really quite a, a remarkable um, bit of research to, to look at, at Christy Walsh and a little backtrack a, a little bit. A few years ago, I wrote a book lights, camera, fastball, how the Hollywood stars changed baseball. Well, Christy Walsh's daughter married Bob Cobb, who was the owner of the Brown Derby and the owner of the Hollywood Stars baseball team. So I had a little bit of, of uh, knowledge through uh, his grandson of Christy Walsh, but I didn't have a real big picture understanding of him. And Christy Walsh was an interesting guy. Really, you could call him the, the Scott Boris of, 19, of the 1920s. He was really the first agent, uh, if you will. They didn't allow agents to come in and represent players in contract talks. But he went out and, and arranged endorsement deals and ultimately set up the barnstorming tours for Babe Ruth. And at the end of the 26th season, Babe Ruth was really in, in trouble. He was pretty close to, if not broke. Uh, he had had a very expensive separation from his wife. They were not going to divorce, uh, both being Catholics. And uh, it was a six-figure separation fee, plus his farm in Massachusetts. And, and Ruth was a lavish spender. He had nine expensive vehicles that he owned. Uh, and, and he liked to play the ponies as well as the dog tracks uh, in uh, Florida during spring training. And he never played it well. Uh, so Ruth was really in financial trouble. And Christy Walsh was trying to get him on his feet and, and get him set up for life after baseball. And, uh, and he was having a challenge. So the two things he set up for him after the 26th season, one was a vaudeville tour. And Ruth uh, generated about $50,000 off that, uh, telling some baseball stories and showing a little film of his highlights and signing autographs, things of that nature. And then the, the second, he 
got him a motion picture deal uh, to star in a movie, Babe Comes Home. And uh, part of the uh, the deal that Wall struck with Ruth was that when he went to Hollywood, he had to take with him a, a personal trainer, a fitness trainer. Uh, since the 25 season, when he had the major stomach surgery, uh, the so-called bellyache heard around the world, uh, Ruth had really been in decline. And there was a lot of um, I think the, the, the prevailing attitude of the, time, of the day was that the Ruth's career was on the downside and uh, he was heading into some of his final seasons. And Christy Walsh was really concerned and, and wanted to get Ruth set up financially. And so the, the movie deal would pay him potentially $100,000. But Walsh saw more to it than that. He saw the opportunity to have Babe isolated and away from his vices in New York. And uh, so Ruth agreed and he hired uh, uh, Artie McGovern, uh, who had trained the, the great boxer Jack Dempsey, along with a lot of business executives, brought him out to Hollywood, uh, had him there with him for a couple of months. And Artie McGovern, believe it or not, had Babe Ruth running five miles every morning. Uh, he had him doing a lot of weight work. Uh, McGovern recognized how competitive Ruth was, and so he had him doing things like boxing and playing handball. And uh, when he had finished the 1926 season, Ruth weighed 254. When he checked into spring training for the 1927 season, he weighed 218. And uh, he went practically from the train station in St. Petersburg to the golf course to play around before he went out to spring training. And a couple of sports writers who played with him couldn't believe how far he was hitting the ball off the tee. And in his first batting practice, his teammates couldn't believe how far he was hitting the ball. So it was a different Babe Ruth in 27. He reinvigorated his, his baseball career and uh, had the remarkable 60 home run season. Yeah, when you talk about the, you, you had a little excerpt of a golf game on one of his drives. I believe it was like three hundred and sixty some yards, or maybe three hundred eighty yards. I forget. Unbelievable. You know, the the pros today with all the modern equipment and uh, balls and everything would probably be proud of a drive like that. And uh, Babe Ruth could swing him any almost any uh, thing, a bat, a club, it didn't and, matter. And that, it like. and that was really the only part of his golf game that was any good, believe it or not, Darren. He <laughs> people who played with him and saw him golf said that he he was a hacker. Uh, but boy, off the tee, that was a different story. Maybe long drive competition could have been his thing. Yeah. Going back, uh, to, to Walsh, you know, it, it was really interesting, uh, the way that he sort of, um, he made his relationship with, uh, Babe Ruth. And I, if you could talk about that a little bit, I thought that was extremely fascinating and clever what he did. Well, uh, Christy Walsh had been in the newspaper business. He'd been a, a sports writer. Uh, in Southern California, and then, then shifted over into the advertising business, and uh, ultimately was in New York City working for an agency, and uh, the agency lost a couple of major accounts, had to lay people off, and Christy Walsh was was out of work, and, and he was really struggling. He was, he and his wife, uh, you know, were down to just their final few dollars in the bank, and, and he hit on an idea uh, when he had worked in newspapers in Los Angeles. He was uh, somewhat aware of syndication and ghostwriting. And uh, he thought that perhaps he could do the same thing. He knew he'd have to get some big names uh, to be involved, that, that he could maybe sell newspapers on buying syndicated columns, ghostwritten by uh, major names. And uh, the biggest name of the era was Babe Ruth. So Christy Walsh set out to try and land a contract with Babe Ruth. And you know, it, it, to your point, it was a very funny story because Walsh uh, staked out Ruth's uh, the apartment building where Ruth lived. And Ruth knew that there were a lot of people with schemes and scams uh, walking the sidewalk in front of his building. So he always went out a back way to avoid them. And uh, Walsh became a little uh, concerned because he read in the paper that Ruth was leaving uh, the next day for Hot Springs, Arkansas. That's where a lot of ballplayers went to get in shape before going to spring training. And so he realized he had one day left to try to get in front of Ruth. And he, he uh, had staked out the apartment building and took a little break walked into a delicatessen just as the owner of the delicatessen had hung up the phone that one of his clients wanted a case of beer and, and his delivery guy had, had left and, and was off on another delivery. And uh, Christy Walsh quickly realized that the owner of the delicatessen was talking about Babe Ruth as the guy who ordered the beer. And so he volunteered to run the case of beer up to Ruth's apartment. And uh, once, once inside, Ruth thought he might have recognized Walsh, but they chatted a little bit, and Walsh took advantage and and uh, uh, laid out his proposal to Ruth, and, and Ruth liked it. And Walsh grabbed for a uh, Ruth went into the next room to grab a pen. Walsh started checking his pockets and realized that he had left the contract back in the delicatessen. <laughs> so he had to run to the train station and agree to meet Ruth at the train station the next day. 
and uh, they got the deal signed, and uh, that changed the, the course of Christy Walsh's life. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a, a brilliant idea about the ghostwriting, and, you know, a, a brilliant and timely scheme to uh, get there to meet Ruth. But, you know, I, I found it fascinating because you alluded to it a little bit here, and you mentioned a few times in the book, you know, Ruth was taken advantage of by so many people on to make you know, poor investments or uh, just throw money away uh, at uh, f- very frivolous things. So it must be that uh, Christy Walsh must have been a, a heck of a salesman or made a lot, made some kind of a great connection with Ruth to, to get into his uh, company to, you know, to be, do that ghost writing. It's a good point you make. And, and I'm not a hundred percent certain whether it was babe or babe's wife, Helen, that really took to him uh, because Helen Ruth uh, did see him as a confidant and someone who could kind of be the family's buffer uh, with the media. Uh, and so she really came to rely heavily on Christy Walsh. Walsh felt like, you know, one of the things that he did was uh, he, there was a date where he had to make his first payment to Ruth. And he knew that Ruth had been taken advantage of by a lot of people uh, who, who didn't fulfill their end of the bargain. And Ruth either never got paid or lost money on deals. And so he, he made a point of bar- being able, he was able to borrow money based on his, the contract with Ruth and with some of the newspapers he'd lined up. And he borrowed money in order to, to, to greet Ruth at Yankee Stadium on opening day and pay him, uh, I believe it was 30 days in advance, uh, pay him in full. And, and that really uh, struck Ruth, that this was a, a straight shooter and a guy that he could trust. And it went a long way to cement that relationship. Yeah, and uh, Christy Walsh became, uh, you know, by what you're telling us in the story, so much more than just uh, you know a spokesperson or an agent. Um, he became you know a financial advisor, a friend, uh, you know, sort of that guiding light of conscience to to Babe Ruth. And it's amazing every time that you brought something else up, I'm saying, wow, this guy is like you know layers of an onion. You just keep peeling it back, and he's doing everything for Babe Ruth to try to help the guy. And uh, I thought uh, that I was think, very admirable. And I think one of the fun stories was. But he was trying and trying uh, with all of his might to convince Ruth to invest his money. And, and Ruth wanted no part of investing money. And I don't think he believed in it. I don't think he trusted it. And uh, one of the, what Walsh ultimately did was he put together a scheme where he asked – they were going to celebrate Ruth's 33rd birthday with a promotional um, photo op. He was going to do an endorsement deal with a bank in New York City. And they was, he was going to advertise a new investment account the bank was launching. And so for Ruth's 33rd birthday, uh, he was going to pose handing a check to the bank president for $33,000. And so Walsh told Ruth to draw up this check for $33,000. And they, did the, they went to the bank. They did the photo op with Ruth and the bank president holding the check. And you know, a story appeared in the papers. Ruth was opening this account. And a couple of days later, Ruth called Christy Walsh and said, where's my check? And Ruth said, you're not getting it back. I, I invested it into an account. And, and Ruth just went through the ceiling. I mean, he was really angry about it. And then Christy Walsh sat down with him and laid out kind of the investment tables of what this was going to do for him over the course of his life and, and how continuing to invest could set up Ruth's family uh, to be very wealthy uh, in his post-baseball career. And, and Ruth, that, that kind of turned things around for Ruth. He really... Uh, uh, got excited about it, and he agreed that all the money he made separate from his Yankee salary, he would invest. And he did turn out to be a very wealthy guy uh, in retirement, as did his family. Because you uh, have us at a point in Ruth's life, like you said, it's it's got to be probably the low point of his professional career. He's he's out of shape. He's broke. Uh, you know, like you said, and all this gets turned around by Christy Matthewson's, or I'm sorry, Christy uh, Walsh. Christy Matthewson. We're talking about the wrong. But he did uh, work with baseball. Christy Matthewson as well. Right. Christy yeah. Walsh yeah. Did work with Christy Matthewson. Yeah, that first name's throwing me. That's what it got me a couple <laughs> times. But, but yeah, um, now you sort of turn the tables on our story. Then you you stay with Babe Ruth. Is something one of the unexpected things I did, and you go into a great uh, a bunch of chapters just talking about Ruth and his career, and especially focusing on that 1927 season of the amazing time in Ruth's life. And uh, you know, maybe you could share some stories from from that. Well, one of the interesting things was, you know, as he trained and and was in so much better shape. You know, it, it produced on the field, and and I think one of the remarkable things about that that season that really has never been focused on is his sept his month of September. 
And in the last uh, four weeks of September, Ruth hit 17 home runs. Now, most ballplayers will tell you that the grind of a season hits them in September. In 26, Ruth had admitted to the press that his legs were gone in September. But here he was, you know, I think if I remember right, I've got to go back and double check the numbers. But September may have been his biggest, if, if not one of his biggest months in terms of that home run uh, race. And so for him to, to do that at the end shows the clear benefits of, uh, uh, of what that training did. And, and, and I've talked to some uh, people I know who are strength coaches, and they're really astonished. You know, when you throw the question at them, who was the first uh, professional athlete to embrace strength and conditioning, strength training? And, uh, you know, they'll throw a lot of names out at you, but the last name they'll ever even think of is Babe Ruth. And when I tell that particular story about Ruth working with Artie McGovern in the, the 27 season, they're, 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 they're pretty, pretty dumbfounded by it all. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, I think they probably uh, adopted the stigmatism of Ruth of seeing a cigar in his mouth and, mm -hmm. and maybe down in a nice cold one or something, but uh, and a little bit, you know, a little pudgy on the pudgy side, not an athlete like he really was, especially in that season. Fascinating. Um, now, I guess one of the things that I was really drawn to, and I, I knew the what the result of this part of the story was, but that home run race between him and Gehrig that season, I mean, this is part of, I'm reading that part of the book and, you know, something was going on in my home. I'm like, Hey, wait a second. I, I can't put this down. I got to finish this to get to the end. And I knew the end, what is going. So great job on, on writing that. Maybe you could talk a little about him and Gehrig a little. Well, Gehrig, uh, you know, he got off to a slow start, but boy, by May, he really started uh, with the power. Uh, he, he had a tremendous year that particular season and he was the MVP. Uh, but the two of them had a, a, an incredible leapfrog battle uh, for home run leadership through uh, really June, July, and early August. Um, you know, Gehrig, that was that was really a breakout season for him in terms of, of his power hitting. And and the two, it was interesting because you saw newspapers around the country uh, in the research I did that almost took sides. Uh, there were columnists who were really cheering for Lou and saying, Lou's the new hero, while there were others saying, you know, uh, Babe's the guy, he's going to pull this out. And, and it, the two of them really teamed to captivate America. I mean, th this was the summer of Lindbergh. This was Lucky Lindy's summer to make that transatlantic flight and and uh you know he really captivated uh, the the newspaper headlines uh for a few days but he quickly got pushed off those headlines by Gehrig and Ruth once again um it, it, the people set up their summer vacations to go to cities and watch the Yankees so they could see Gehrig and Ruth I mean the the Queen of England's doctor uh came over to Chicago uh, and, and and set a day aside from a medical conference to, to go out and see Babe Ruth, hoping he would get to see him hit a home run. It, it was absolutely remarkable to see how, how these two guys and their, their leapfrog race uh, in terms of home run hitting really garnered the attention of, of a country. It was, you know, you can think about the Sosa McGuire chase from a number of years back. This was that times 10. It, it was really a, a remarkable summer of baseball and, and home run hitting. Now, I think uh, you have a couple different places in the book, or one in particular that really sums up how enthralled people were with watching that race and watching Babe Ruth and Gehrig uh, hit home runs that summer. And that happens up at Fenway Park. And I, I thought that was an amazing uh, picture. I'm just picturing this in my mind, knowing the rivalry of these two teams and the, you know, the cities, when it comes to baseball season, those two cities don't like each other in the American league. That's for sure. But boy, what a, what a great fan support. If you could speak to that a bit. Well, there was a particular game where uh, they sold out Fenway Park. And when fans saw gates being shut, and uh, ticket office windows being shuttered, uh, they stormed certain gates to, and bust, busted down gates in center field and in left field and, and rushed into the ballpark. And they had to hold up the game because fans were on the field. Uh, they had to figure out what to do. And they ended up standing fans. I can't recall how deep they were, but pretty much from a spot against the wall equal to third base all the way around the outfield and, and equal to first base. Uh, they had to hold up the game because a lot of the fans were milling around in front of the Yankee dugout, hoping to see Babe and say hello to Babe and Gehrig. It, it was absolutely remarkable. I, I can't recall off the top of my head the, the total numbers they got into the park that day, but uh, it, it was astounding. And, of course, Ruth hit a shot 
that uh, they, they talked about maybe one of the longest home runs he, he had ever hit there. Um, and, and what's really interesting is that 47%, 47% of the Red Sox season attendance came from their 12 home dates with the New York Yankees. That's, that's how remarkable and, and, and riveted baseball fans in Boston were uh, with what was going on that summer. And the Red Sox were not in the race. They were there to watch you know, this home run duel. Yeah, and I, I believe you, you bring it out. They're like double-digit games behind the Yankees at that point in time. There's no way they're they're catching them in the race, but still they sell out that ballpark, and you describe people across the street on the roofs of houses and everything. It had to be an amazing scene. Absolutely, and it, you're right. I mean, it was just – they were great baseball fans. It's a great baseball city still today, and uh, they appreciated what was going on and wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, that was just a, a great part of the story. And I'm, I'm glad that you shared that and, uh, you know, brought that to light because I don't, I didn't realize the importance of that, that race between Gehrig and, and Babe Ruth and how it propelled the Yankees into you know, the success they had that year. Now, I, I guess we uh, want to talk about sort of the aftermath, you know, maybe you could, and this is really, you allude to it a little bit in the book, but what, what did, did, uh, like uh, Christy Walsh bring to, to sports that still carries on to this day. Oh, do you think he was like, uh, I know he was a great innovator, but what, what, what's the product that he uh, has brought to the baseball and professional sports? Well, I certainly think his work lining up outside income for, for the players that he represented um, really set the stage and brought a lot of other people into that particular business. Uh, I think it's interesting. You know, we were talking about the Garrick Ruth home run chase and, and Garrick faded late in the season. Uh, part of that, I believe, uh, was that his mother underwent surgery in August, and I think he became distracted. He did go into a slump. Uh, it also you know, could have been a fitness thing because he signed on uh, with Christy Walsh to represent him in, uh, in outside baseball endeavors following the, the 27 season. And like Ruth, he hired Artie McGovern uh, to come in and train him uh, in the offseason as well. So you know, I think that there's, there's a little bit of a – Christy Walsh influence there. But, and I do think Walsh took on other players uh, and was able to arrange a lot of uh, uh, endorsement deals for them. So I think you know, he was the first. He was the pioneer. He, there were some guys who tried to do that for Ruth uh, a year or two earlier. And, and I think uh, they did get him a little bit of money here and there. But but Walsh was able to, to really bring him some significant income. And, and, uh, and other players saw that as well. And I think other people that was some business savvy saw that and, and started positioning themselves to do that for other players as well. So we can say he's the first agent. Technically, he didn't negotiate contracts, but he had a way to, to try and do that. He, he, he worked his contacts in the press and uh, put a lot of numbers out there in the press saying that it was going to take this or that to sign Babe. And uh, he tried to use the, the pressure of the press to force the Yankees uh, into paying Babe what Christy Walsh felt he was worth. But uh, the, the rules of the day did not allow him to be in the room with uh, the Yankees ownership and, and Babe Ruth to, to negotiate a contract on Babe's behalf. So he had to leave it to, to trying to negotiate through the press. Yeah, it was uh, you really depicted that well. And even the negotiation process, even with uh, Walsh uh, rehearsing everything with Babe for, for weeks on end and uh, the deal gets set and it's nothing what Walsh wants. Uh, yeah, babe and, caved. <laughs> yeah, right. That's an amazing, that amazing part of the story, too. So, uh, Dan, why don't you give us the name of the book again and where folks can get a copy of it at? Well, the book is titled Baseball at the Abyss. It's available, uh, as most books today are, on Amazon.com. Also, BarnesandNoble.com has it. The publisher is Roman and Littlefield, and it is on their website as well, R-O-W-M-A-N.com. Well, it's an amazing book, and I want to extend my thanks uh, to you and to Roman Littlefield for uh, sending me an advanced copy to, to read it so we can prepare for this. And uh, it was a pleasure talking to you today, Dan. I wish you well on the book, and uh, hope to talk about some, maybe some of your other books, too, on some upcoming uh, episodes of the podcast. So thank you for joining us today, Dan. Oh, this was a great treat. I appreciate the invitation and look forward to talking to you down the road. Thanks. Sorry, but my pitching coach just called timeout, and he's coming out to the mound. I think I'm going to get yanked for a reliever. We'll see you back tomorrow for some more great sports history on Sports Jersey Dispatch Podcast.
We invite you to check out our websites, jerseydispatch.com and pigskindispatch.com. Not only see the daily sports history, but to experience the preservation of great events and people that play the games. Find us on Pigskin Dispatch. It's also on social media outlets of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel. To get all your daily sports history. Pigskin Dispatch is happy to be associated with the Sports History Network, the sports headquarters of yesteryear, found at sportshistorynetwork.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hi, this is Joe Ziemba, the host of When Football Was Football, here on the Sports History Network. I'm very pleased to announce that I will be partnering with the Sports History Network to give away two copies of my latest book called Bears vs. Cardinals, the NFL's Oldest Rivalry. To enter, just head over to the following link, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. We hope you'll enjoy the numerous stories in the book, which is largely based on the newly released Dutch Sternemann collection at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Dutch was the co-owner of the early Chicago Bears with George Hallis and kept correspondence, financial records, and scouting reports, which now allow us to peek into the management of an NFL club during the first few years of the league's existence. Along the way, we'll meet unusual gridiron characters from years gone by, including a quarterback who could throw the ball farther behind his back than he could throwing it forward, a Bears lineman who was such a good tavern fighter that he decided to enter the boxing universe, and a Cardinals halfback who gave up the NFL rushing title by deciding to not show up for his team's final game of the season. And can we forget the time the Al Capone mob interrupted a Bears-Cardinals game? The new book was fun to research, and I hope you'll enter our free contest today. Once the winners are selected, we'll be in touch regarding shipping as well as to inscribe the book personally for you. This might make a perfect gift for Mother's or Father's Day or simply add it to your own personal collection. Once again, enter by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Thank you and good luck.